Good evening. And thank you for coming out tonight for the debate on homelessness and, and affordable housing. Uh, tonight's de debate was organized by the Social Justice Committee of the Board of Our Place, and it was led by Stephen Hammond. I have a few thank yous to do before we get started. So please join me in thanking Stephen Hammond, Colin Kerr, the board, staff, and volunteers who made this debate possible. There are some, some chairs still up in front here if anybody at the back wants to, wants to sit down. I'd also like to thank our media sponsors, Czech TV, CBC Radio, and the Times Colonist. And the individuals that helped make up the questions for tonight that uh, included uh, Bernie Pauly from UVic and uh, Andrew Wynn Williams from the Coalition Dead Homelessness. <laughs> People will be introduced shortly, but I'd like to uh, thank our, our panelists and our candidates um, and, and the moderator. So we acknowledge that uh, we're, we're all sitting and standing on traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. So I'd like to invite Bernice Camano to come up with and, and offer a, a blessing and a welcome. I'm not that tall. <laughs> Good evening. In my language, we say Gala Kessler. Gayla Kessler to you all. This evening we're here to talk about something that not only is important to you, but is important to me. Many, many years ago my mother was on the, what was called then Skid Row, what is now called the Downtown East Side, which is a, a place that, um, where people are in trauma and in pain. And it honors me to see all of you people here willing to look at how to make changes, how to work together. It's really important. No one has the right answer, but as a community, in my culture, we work together. So I honor you all, and I, I want you to come from your heart and your head and make sure they both work together in order to come up with solutions. I honor you all. Gayla Kessler. Okay. Thank you, Bernice. And so now let's get on to the debate. Um, tonight's moderator is Khalil Akhtar. <coughs> Khalil is a award-winning radio journalist at the CBC. He can be heard daily as co-host on CBC Radio, Radio's On the Island, and his weekly radio column on food issues airs on CBC morning programs across Canada. He also teaches South Asian cuisine at Cook Culture in Victoria, so please join me in welcoming our moderator, Leila Akhtar. Thanks for coming, everyone. It's good to see so many faces. Uh, and a very diverse crowd. Um, so tonight we focus on one of this community's most enduring and, and, and perhaps most challenging issues. At CBC we've covered homelessness issues uh, in many different ways. We've covered the issue from many different angles and I've come to the conclusion over these many years that I've worked at CBC Radio in Victoria that this is an issue that shouldn't be muddled by personal or partisan politics. This is an issue that needs to be tackled uh, in a very pragmatic way. Um, it should be an evidence-based solution. The challenge is that we often don't agree on what the evidence even is and what the pragmatic solutions are. Uh, so tonight we'll try and uh, perhaps answer some of those or, or, or uh, come to some common agreement on what some of those pragmatic uh, answers are to the issue, issue of homelessness. And I know we don't always agree on those points, and that's why we're here. Um, so I'll introduce at this point, I'm just going to swing over this way. 
so I can face everyone here on the panel. I'm going to introduce everyone, first of all the candidates, and then our uh, panel of questioners here down at the front who will be in charge of perhaps focusing the debate, asking the questions, asking some follow-up questions, and I'll run down exactly how the evening uh, will play out. So closest to me here is Lisa Helps, candidate for mayor. Uh, she's a community organizer beyond her, Dean Fortin. He's the incumbent current mayor of Victoria. Ida Chong is a former liberal cabinet minister and MLA for Oak Bay Gordon Head. And beyond Ida is Stephen, uh, Stephen Andrew, former journalist, now running for mayor. Down here in front of the crowd, uh, we've got the three uh, panelists on our, uh, on our, what should we, I was going to call it a media panel, but Bernie Polly doesn't quite fit, quite fit in. We begin with Bernie Polly. She's a professor in the, nurse, in the School of Nursing at UVic. She's also a scientist in the Center for Addictions Research at BC. Mary Griffin is sitting beside her. Mary Griffin is a journalist at Czech. And Dave Obi, beyond her, is a journalist at the Times Colonist. So welcome to you all. Thanks for being here. Now, a few notes on how this will all play out. We're going to uh, split this evening up into a few sections. Uh, after I finish explaining all this, we'll uh, dive into some opening statements from each of the candidates. They'll each be given four minutes to speak, and we've chosen randomly in what order they'll speak. After that, we're going to go to a series of very black and white questions, just to set the stage here. Everyone will be given the opportunity on the panel to uh, explain where they stand on a variety of, variety of issues. I've got nine questions, and they'll just stake a claim uh, one way or another on a number of those. After that, we'll move on to panel questions. So the panel here in the front will ask the candidates uh, a series of questions, and those questions will be uh, open to a bit of casual debate. We'll give five minutes to each of those questions, uh, with 30 seconds off the top for each of the candidates uh, to perhaps uh, just give a few uh, remarks before getting into that five-minute debate. The panel will then have an opportunity to ask follow-up questions if needed, and then we'll move on. After that, closing statements, two minutes each to each of the candidates. And again, we'll uh, go with the randomly selected number, except we'll go in reverse. Now, the audience participation, that's a good question. The audience participation is going to happen uh, thanks to those yellow notepads, which are circulating around, around the crowd. There are a few people with uh, yellow notepads around. Raise your hand if you've got a question. You'll be given a piece of paper on which to write that question, and that question will end up at the, at, at the panel table here up front. We'll try and get as many of them in. What if people can't write? Ask your neighbor to help. That's my suggestion. All right, shall we, shall we kick it into high gear? I'm just re reminding myself of who's first here. So Dean Fortin is first on this, Ida Chong is second, Lisa Helps is third, and Stephen Andrew uh, picked the short straw. He's fourth. Uh, we'll reverse that order for the closing statements. So Dean Fortin, you have four minutes to give some opening remarks. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And this is actually amazing. I've been spending the last six years as mayor, and many of my years as council before that, and for 17 years working at the Burnside Gorge Community Center. And if I can say one priority that has stood above, above them all for me, has been affordable housing and homelessness. To see this many people here interested in this reinforces exactly what all of us on this stage want to see a commitment to making things different in the city, a commitment to making things better for everyone. Now, I am honored to be mayor in the city of Victoria and to be co-chair of the Coalition to End Homelessness. And I look forward to the opportunity to continue in both those roles with your support. During my first two terms as mayor, worked hard with many of you to build a city, a city that's more dynamic, that's more prosperous, that's more livable and inclusive. Today, Victoria is more dynamic, it is more vibrant, and it's more of a progressive city than it was just a few short years ago. We have worked hard 
to contain costs, but to make sure that we left no one behind, to continue and increase funding for our community centers and our senior centers and our library. And of course, we have worked hard on affordable housing and homelessness. And our job is not done yet. And that's why I'm asking for your continued support. Affordable housing and homelessness has been a top priority for me since day one. Before I was elected as mayor, I helped establish the Victoria Association for Street Kids, worked with young homeless adults and street youth. And then I worked for 17 years with the Burnside Gorge Community Centre and helped build a community centre that was more than just a community centre. And we did family, homeless family outreach programs that continue today, family support services, and a family self-sufficiency program, looking for a way to break the cycle of poverty and homelessness. And as co-chair of the Greater Victoria Coalition to End Homelessness, it's been a great, great honor to work, work alongside people from our place, from all the social services, all of the funders, the service providers, to address this issue in our community and make sure it remained the top priority. And together, as a community and as a city, we have worked to build more than 450 units of supportive and affordable housing. We have increased investment in community programs and built relationships with senior governments that are generating positive results for our citizens. The coalition has created a plan to end homelessness and we're working hard to see those results. We have a plan and it's working and we're making real differences in people's lives. And we put together a six point plan to address and end homelessness in Victoria by 2018 and I look forward to discussing those details with you tonight. But let me emphasize this. Our job is not done. We still have so much more to do to ensure that every citizen in this city has a place to call home and has access to the supports and services that they need for a healthy and to be successful. And I believe that as our moral and our social responsibility. For those that don't agree with me on that point, perhaps I will say this. The bottom line says that studies show that the cost of ignoring homelessness is far greater than the cost of providing housing and services. You know, Megaphone just days ago released a report on homeless deaths in British Columbia that found the life expectancy for a homeless person is almost half that of the average British Columbia. This is absolutely unacceptable and it's why we must remain committed to ending homelessness in Victoria. And I'm proud of what we've been able to do together. I'm proud of the support that we have and we will continue to share our hopes and aspirations for this extraordinary city. A livable, a prosperous, and a progressive Victoria. One that leaves no one behind. Thank you, Dean Fortin. Uh, number two on our list, Ida Chong. Good evening, everyone. So allow me to begin by thanking uh, our hosts for the time that they've taken to organize this debate on really an important issue. I want to begin by acknowledging two things. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the success of the organizations that have made homelessness and affordable housing a priority across this city. Their dedication, their efforts to tackle such a challenging issue that many cities across the province and indeed across the country have been struggling with. It does seem to be a universal challenge though, and it, it's right across North America in fact. And it affects each and every one of us in one way or another. Secondly, I would like to acknowledge that even with all the efforts and the successes, and there have been some, and I will acknowledge as uh, Dean Fortin has said, there have been some very good successes here over the past decade, and actually since Mayor Alan Lowe established the Coalition to End Homelessness, the problem still persists. In reality, though, uh, I've been advised that the number of homeless has not changed dramatically, and housing continues to be unaffordable, which is why we are still trying to address the issue of affordability. But that's not to say that everyone's efforts has been in vain. So we do need to continue, we do need to continue to confront the problem by seeking innovative and new ideas, but at the same time, keeping those proven, tested measures that have been actually providing positive results. 
So in tonight's discussion, I expect we will hear some new ideas, and I do look forward to hearing those and sharing each and every one of our views, how to deal with homelessness and affordable housing. But what I would like to emphasize, though, is the importance, as well, of managing the city's finances in an efficient and an effective manner so that we do not otherwise waste very precious taxpayers' dollars that could have been utilized in funding these very worthwhile initiatives that actually help the homeless, that actually create affordable housing. And so when I see the cost overrun, overruns, like the Johnson Street Bridge replacement project that was originally pitched at $63 million to taxpayers, currently at $92.8 million and climbing, I am dismayed because that's $30 million of overrun that if it had been made available to the housing trust could have provided for 3,000, 3,000 units of affordable housing or if the city were actually to have built the affordable housing, 200 units. That's why I'm dismayed. And these are the numbers that are based on the State of Homeless in Canada 2014 report. Um, I downloaded it, it's a 73 page report and there's lots of great information there. So managing the city's finances are important to me because I know that in the next few years there are going to be other significant infrastructure projects such as the Crystal Pool at Central Park, the number one fire hall, the Bay Street or Ellis Street Bridge as we know it. They need to be addressed and if we need to address those, what will that do to the needed dollars to deal with affordable housing? And when we deal with those infrastructure costs, we cannot afford those costs to spin out of control. I am a professional designated accountant by education and training, and I absolutely understand a balance sheet and what operations need to be maintained. So finally, in dealing with homelessness and affordable housing, I want to recognize that Victoria cannot and should not be the only municipality dealing with it. It's a regional issue, it's a provincial issue, it's a national issue, and we need to have partnerships working together hand in hand to make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ida. Next up, Lisa Helps. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming this evening, and I too, like Ida and Dean, look forward to hearing some new ideas tonight, because I think we've been, as Khalil says, working on this problem for a long time, all together here in this room, and we need some new ideas and some fresh perspectives. So I do prefer, as those who will know me, know well, to talk about the future and look forward. And before I do that, and I do have six concrete ideas that I'd like to raise tonight, either in my opening remarks or in response to some of the questions. But before I do that, I want to look backward just a little bit, because it's come to my attention over the course of this campaign that my commitment to poverty prevention and homelessness and housing has been called into question. So I just want to outline a little bit for everybody here who doesn't know me some of the work that I've done on this issue for almost 20 years in Victoria. I completed a master's degree on the history of housing and homelessness in Victoria from 1871 to 1901 and it's online if you want to struggle through it. Um, I then went on to work on a PhD on the history of housing, homelessness and the governance of poverty in Victoria and San Francisco between 1930 and 1970. And that PhD was funded by the Trudeau Foundation, which gives 15 scholarships per year to Canadians to work on ideas that can create change in the world. Now, I didn't finish my PhD because it turned into an organization called Community Microlending. And that organization makes loans to people here in Victoria who are struggling with poverty, coming maybe out of prison, off the streets, out of a transition home, or maybe even just out of UVic with a high student debt. And what we do at Community Microlending, and I love this part, we match people in the community who have money to lend with people in the community who need to borrow a little bit of money. And the inspiration for this organization actually came through my PhD research from the Depression in Victoria, when believe it or not, our ancestors here in the 1930s, they did something very similar. And as the executive director of community microlending for almost five years, I walked alongside people as they walked out of poverty. 
While I was working on my PhD, I was also a volunteer at Fernwood Energy, and uh, many of you know the cornerstone story. We bought a uh, boarded up building in the centre of our neighbourhood, built four units of affordable housing for families. After that we thought, wow, that was successful, so we bought another piece of land in our neighbourhood and built six more units of affordable housing for families. And both of those projects were funded, and this is credit to the current Mayor, by the City's Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, through the years I've also done a lot of strategic planning and visioning work uh, with AIDS Vancouver Island, with the Oasis Society, uh, with Bernie Pauly and her Street Stories group some years back. And I was chair of the Bread and Roses Collective for three years and that the mayor referred to the megaphone paper. That used to be the street news and I worked hard every month to make sure that paper hit the streets so that people living on low incomes in our community could sell that paper on the city streets. So that's just a little bit more about me. Um, six ideas in 30 seconds or less, I don't know if I can do it. Um, <laughs> continue to fund the city's affordable housing trust fund and in year three of our term look to increase that funding. Uh, look for creative solutions including partnering with private sector landlords to get some of their units into play. Supporting the Community Social Planning Council's new civic investment fund. Did you know you can now lend money in Victoria and have it turn into affordable housing and Justin Stevenson is running for council as the chair of that. I'll leave it at that because I don't want to rush. Three more ideas coming. Thank you so much for coming this evening and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you Lisa. Thanks for respecting the clock there. That, that was good. It's handy having those lights in the back. Uh, finally, four minutes go to Stephen Andrew. Thank you, Khalil. Well, I'm thrilled to be here tonight to talk to you about uh, an issue that has challenged our city and continues to challenge our city every day. And it is an issue that I know very well. In my early 20s, I was homeless. I lived on the street for about six months. I haven't talked about this before because uh, it's a very personal issue to me and it really stems from uh, a disagreement with the family over my uh, way of life. Homelessness, mental health, and addiction, I know very well in many instances, appears to go hand in hand. Today, I released, and I hope many of you received it, a plan for a healthier, safer city. Now, it's a blueprint on what I believe is going to help us move forward, tackling the symptoms of the issue, but more important, dealing with the cause. The key issue, of course, is a lack of affordable housing. I believe it's a compassionate plan with emphasis on taking affirmative action while also considering the needs of our entire community. It's too long to read, and as I mentioned, we did distribute the plan, so I ask you to have a look, and if you have any ideas to strengthen it, I would welcome those. But let me give you a couple of highlights. I've already introduced progressive ideas, talking about addiction and mental health and working with uh, more treatment uh, beds to encourage, and also encourage our recovery community to get involved in helping with addiction. We must give those without homes dignity. It's why I'm also proposing that in the first year of my mandate, I will open up a personal property lockup in the downtown area to provide security for those of the belongings of people who are homeless. I also commit to treating homelessness, mental health and addiction, and not having law enforcement as a significant manager of services. But tonight, I'd like to take the rest of my opening remarks to talk a little bit about the democratic process and how I see this campaign unfolding. I got into this race because I really believe that I could make a change, that it would bring real difference to the leadership and we could stand up for Victoria. And I'm also, as a former journalist, calling out those who are inconsistent in their message and their promises. I also believe, as you know, that party politics shouldn't play any role in local elections. Sadly, I believe our current mayor appears not to agree. It's why today our campaign filed a complaint with the Chief Electoral Officer and BC's Privacy Commissioner, alleging that Dean Fortin and John Luton are contracting the NDP to contact voters. But it's a service that is using personal information to the NDP that was provided by supporters and volunteers, and it was only meant to be used in provincial campaigns. Now the mayor, you will hear a little bit later, says that I'm doing this to highlight the strong friends and leadership that he has. Well, that's complete nonsense. 
I'm highlighting it because I believe it's a violation of the law. And then there's Lisa Helms. She promises to be lead with openness and commitment and to tell you the truth. Well, sadly, she hasn't followed that commitment. In the latest edition of Focus Magazine, and I encourage you to pick one up, there's an article by Jean Miller endorsing Lisa and offensively slamming her opponents. But if Lisa is open and transparent, the one thing she didn't do was disavow that article and tell you that indeed Jim Miller has been working on her campaign for the past year and that he is a major supporter of hers. So I've got more to say about this a little bit later, but I have to tell you that if we're being open and transparent, ladies and gentlemen, we need to be open and transparent with you during the election. I'm running for change. I sincerely hope that these politicians here will change too so that we can bring you progress on the issue of homelessness, mental health, and addiction. Thank you. But Stephen Ender, thank you all for uh, taking the allotted time and no more. It's very useful to us all. It's now, uh, what time is it here? It's almost 7.30. We're gonna take 10 minutes now to run through uh, a number of very foundational questions. You have a bare bone sort of amount of time for each of those. These are, these are black and white questions, uh, support or oppose sort of questions. Um, so I encourage you to take literally 30 or 40 seconds for each of these. I'm going to reverse the order that we did the opening statements in, so I'll do this, uh, I'll, I'll give the first question first to Stephen, and then, uh, and then down the line perhaps. Uh, Ida, then Dean, then Lisa. So Stephen Andrew, do you support or oppose the housing first philosophy? Totally support the housing first philosophy uh, strategy, I believe. I've been to Portland and see that it works. I'd like to see a transitional program so we have wet housing transform into uh, a detox, then into transitional, and then into supportive housing. Thank you, Stephen. Ida Chong. I support it. Dean Fortin, do you support or oppose the housing first philosophy? I totally support the housing first philosophy. And Lisa? Yes, I support it, and I think all levels of government have a role to play in supporting it as well. Yeah. Lisa Helps, question number two, do you support or oppose the building of social housing in higher income neighborhoods? I absolutely support it. Our diversity is what makes us strong. Dean Fortin? I support it, we've been working for it. It needs to be in all areas of Victoria and in all areas of the capital region. Everyone. Ida, do you support or oppose the building of social housing in higher income neighborhoods? I would be so supportive of that as well. And when I indicated that uh, this is a regional, provincial, national issue, uh, issue, it means everywhere that we have land, that we are able to partner with people to have housing built, we should be doing that. And Stephen Andrew. Totally support it, uh, however that has not been happening. I live in the Burnside Gorge area and a major uh, concentration of that housing has been built there. I definitely think we need to spread it out through the region and we need the region to support it too. You now have support there as well. Um, we'll start with Dean Fortin on this one. And this is a big one, this is a bit of a mouthful. Since the police spend the vast majority of their resources addressing mental health addictions and homelessness issues on our streets, for which they have not been fully trained, do you support or oppose a reallocation of a portion of the police budget toward mental health addiction and homelessness services? It's not a simple question because fundamentally when we say it's responding, but you're responding to someone in crisis. And so for instance, if somebody is um, going down because of an overdose, our police are responding from that. Am I supposed to cut that? So fundamentally, what I need to do is to make sure that we're getting the right resources from all other areas, including, and then we can cut those services. But the police are the only 24-7 show up and help you when you need help that we have. We've had downloading from senior levels of government, so we need to shift those resources. Uh, but fundamentally, when you call the police, they have to go. Ida Chong, do you support the shifting of police resources to deal with mental health addiction and homelessness services? Uh, thank you. I, I would have to say, you know, 
it's the same as Dean Hewitt's, not as a simple answer. Shifting of resources, are you referring to the dollars, uh, stri strictly using dollars, that wouldn't necessarily affect any change. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak to the police chief and I know he is saying that because they are being uh, required to be in the emergency room departments as they're dealing with some of these issues, they aren't able to be on the streets and I think that causes anxiety amongst other taxpayers. So I do believe we have to find a better way so that they can be more effective and if it does require specialization uh, with some of the, uh, the police services, that may need to be happening. But I uh, wouldn't just take away from one to another and then create another unintended consequence. Stephen Andrew? I do support the uh, reallocation of funds, and I'll tell you why. If you look at my uh, platform here, you will see a couple of things. One, I deal with policing resources and the amount of time that they spend at the hospital. And uh, if I had my way, if they're spending more than an hour up there, we would build the uh, Island Health Authority to deal with the, the amount of time. You seem need to know that when an officer goes up there, they can spend an inordinate amount of time, and it cannot be up to two or four officers, and that can take a significant dent in police resources. But please also look when I talk about addiction arrests. I would like to see a model similar so to that in Portland where we have the... Uh, um, the police do not arrest those that are on the street. We deal with it as a health issue. We have a purpose built Stephen, facility. we'll get into the details in, in a moment, but, but thank you yep. for, for your, your, your uh, clear statement off the top there. Lisa helps. Do you support a reallocation of some police services to deal with mental health addiction and homelessness? Yes, I've been saying for years, and the police do have civilian people who work there. There are civilians who work at the police force, and I've been saying for years, wouldn't it be great if the police could also employ street nurses? So if it's ever going to happen in the history of the city, it will happen in this term with this police chief. Chief Elsner, and many of you have met him, one of the first things he did when he got to town was said, how can the police contribute to community wellness? So I think we can reallocate some resources and, and embed street nursing into the police department. It's a little bit outside the box, so I can see people saying, oh my goodness, that'll never work, but let's at least entertain the question. Thanks. I forget where I started the last time. Uh, I started with Dean last time. I'm gonna start with Ida this time. Ida Chong, do you support or oppose supervised injection sites in Victoria in 20 seconds? I do support them because I have seen that they do save lives and that's what they're meant to do at the end of the day. Stephen Andrew, do you support or oppose supervised injection sites? I support them, but it must have intervention and uh, treatment and recovery models attached. Lisa helps. Uh, exactly what Stephen said and the STS or the, uh, the Safe Consumption Site Pro people have asked us all to fill out a survey, so thank you to them for asking each candidate running in this election to take uh, a stand. So I support it and I will work hard to make sure that we have a safe consumption site in this city. And finally, Dean. Uh, yes, I do support safe consumption sites. I favor a Dr. Peters model, which is that wraparound services that helps provide both uh, prevention services, the safe injection, and medical facilities that are there. We're working hard to get two of them established in the city of Victoria um, because we don't want to have that honeypot effect. Uh, I think we're very close. It's something we've been working on for three years and we can make it happen. Stephen Andrew, back to you. Do you support or oppose higher property taxes to be used toward mental health addiction and homelessness issues? No. Uh, and the reason being is I think we can find them within efficiencies within the current city budgets, $209 million. If we can't figure out where to get that money, then we have no job leading this city. Thank you, Stephen. Ida. Uh, my plan has always been to respect taxpayers by freezing the property tax rates for the next four years. I would look to grow the tax base and bring other sources of revenue into the city budget if we needed to provide more dollars, but not more out of the taxpayers' pockets. And Dean, support or oppose higher property taxes to be used for these services? I think that property taxes provide key services, so yes, I see a certain opportunity for to increase that funding. I also want to say, though, on the other side, that we have opportunities to lower our costs. We're putting money in, whether it be with the police, with FICOT, so we can increase the role that they play there, which is mental health services. We have the mental health car through police services, and we continue to fund the coalition to end homeless at the City of Victoria. So yes, all of those uh, will look to increase to make sure that we can make long-term preventative changes. And Lisa, finally. 
Uh, no, I won't raise property taxes to pay for affordable housing because what that does is it taxes our seniors out of their homes and makes their homes less affordable. I have a very detailed plan on my website for finding creative solutions to save money with the way that we currently work at the city. It doesn't mean cutting services, it doesn't mean cutting jobs, it means working more creatively. And again, go look at lisahelpsvictoria.ca for more information. Four more to get through here. So Lisa Helps, I'll start with you on this one. Do you support or oppose the city contributing land for the purposes of new development of either affordable housing or supported housing projects? Uh, land, potentially. Um, running affordable housing projects, no. And I think we've got lots of creative capacity with our property tax exemption program where we don't necessarily need to buy or give city land, but where we can put underutilized land into play for affordable housing. So I'm, I'm open to options. I want to see a business case to see, is this going to be a cost effective way to get more units built? So I'm open. Dean. Yes, I was supportive of using City of Victoria land to create affordable housing. We did that with the homeless shelter. We've done it on a couple of others. It is just one of the many ways that we can contribute, whether it be through affordable housing fund or not. I do believe partnerships are important and where the city has land and others can bring money to the table to get these units built, uh, it would make sense. So I would be supportive. And Stephen? Totally supportive. Dean, uh, I'll get you to start on this one. Do you support or oppose a managed alcohol program in Victoria? Yes. All of the uh, data and all the information and all of what we've seen from Toronto is we see that within a, what's called wet housing is an opportunity for, for those who cannot manage or cannot quit uh, right away. That is a way to actually decrease what they use. It lowers their hospital bills. It actually improves their health and it provides better form of housing. So it's something we should look at for sure. Ida? I would have to say that uh, because I have not had an opportunity to speak to experts on this, um, I'm, no experts in this I'm not inclined to say that it would be the right uh, direction to go, so I'm not able to support or oppose it at this time, just to be fair. Stephen? I have to be totally open. I support the recovery model, and that would not uh, include offering up alcohol or drugs to any individual that is trying to uh, 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 break the cycle of addiction. And Lisa? Uh, yes, I support a managed alcohol program. If we're going to go with housing first, it's unrealistic to think that we can put people in housing and then expect that all of their addictions will disappear. So we need to make sure that people have housing and the supports they need. So wet housing, it, 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 I can't imagine not doing that. Two more here. Ida, I'll start with you on this one. Do you support or oppose requiring developers to include a social housing component? to market rental housing projects? It would actually have to depend on the particular development and the neighborhood uh, and the community plans there because I know a number of neighborhoods have gone to great lengths to determine what kind of developments they want in their area and I don't want to disrespect that but obviously it would be wonderful to encourage the developer to do so without necessarily have to breaching any community official plans or neighborhood plans. Stephen. I've spoken with developers, they think it's a bad idea. Um, they would much rather contribute to a housing fund to develop uh, housing in uh, an area. It could right be obviously right next door to the property that's being developed, but uh, I would say it could dissuade them from developing in the city and I wouldn't want to do that. I think it's a mixture of, of both. Um, not that we would require it, but that we would say, if you want extra density on a site, build some affordable housing or get a cash contribution to the affordable housing trust fund. Both are options. And we moved forward a project. The land had been zoned some time ago, but we just moved a project through at Planning and Land Use last week. It's a new rental building on Yates Street, and it does have a couple of units of social housing in there. So there is a historical precedent. For me, it needs to, because Stephen makes a good point, it needs to make sure that it's going to uh, encourage development of all forms making sure that we've got a social housing component using the incentives available to us with the bonus density program. Indeed. 
like Lisa, it is a, a yes and both. Um, first of all, we at 834 was a building that's just built over on Johnson Street. We helped uh, Beacon Community Services buy a whole floor and make it inclusionary for those with uh, um, physical uh, disabilities so they could move it in. There's, that, that was used as an incentive as opposed to forcing, and I think that's the way to do it. That's where the wins happen. Thank you, Dean. A clear answer there. So final question. Uh, Stephen, Andrew, I'll have you start with start this one. Do you support or oppose a small tax on gasoline in the CRD to be used towards mental health, addiction, and homeless services? It certainly is an idea. Um, my, I am more in favor of consumption taxes than I am uh, on property taxes. It's something I've never thought of, but it's certainly something I would consider entertaining. Lisa? Uh, Possibly, although I'm not sure that the city has the authority to do that. It's a, it's a good idea. We'd have to look and see whether the city has the capacity to tax gas. I know we get gas tax funds for active transportation, but you know, something to look at for sure. So whoever asked that question, thanks for putting it in our minds. Ida. I would not be supportive of that because uh, what starts off as a small tax ends up getting larger and larger. And uh, then we end up with a problem on our hand. And then the tax revenues don't actually go to where they're supposed to go. Indeed. So for me, the gas tax, we have applied for the province to actually increase gas tax so we increase transit. And the reason why I bring that up is there's many ways to address poverty. Affordable housing is one of them, but making affordable transportation is also a way. Affordability is across the spectrum, and people seem to support the link between gas tax and increasing transit. So that's where I direct it, but recognize that overall, it speaks to the quality of life of all of our citizens. And I want to say this, I'm also a strong supporter of the abstinence model when it comes to housing as well. It's a both answer. Thank you for um, respecting the time limits there, and thank you for the quick answers, and, and uh, in, in most cases, very clear answers on, on those questions. I'm now going to hand it over to our very patient panel. <laughs> Once again, Dave Obi is a journalist with The Times Colonist. Mary Griffin is with Czech TV. And Bernie Pauly is a scientist at Univ the University of Victoria, professor in the School of Nursing, uh, and also an addictions uh, specialist as well there. You've been hard at work. Your table is littered with paper. <laughs> Many of those yellow slips of paper coming in. We've also we've also drafted our own questions before before even coming here. So I'll hand it over uh, to the three of you. A reminder to the process here: every question will will allow 30 seconds to each candidate for a for for a quick baseline answer, and then a five-minute debate on each question. The panel will then have an opportunity to ask any follow-ups, and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Thanks, Cleo. Um, I'm going to start off, and I have to tell you, we are going to give as much priority as we can to the questions from the audience. Um, and uh, one of the first questions um, that came to us is, and this is for everyone, how would you as mayor work on the issue of homelessness at the provincial level? Anyone want to start that off? Everyone's scribbling down. I'll start if you want. I think the, the, the biggest issue that we need to do is provide some leadership in this area. And I think that that is uh, basically through working through inclusion. I would like to develop a strong relationship. And I don't think it just needs to be with the province, but I also think that we need to look at the region and the federal government to try to bring back to the table. They cut funding, as you know, in about 19, late 1980s. We need to develop relationships and provide them with evidence so that they can see the benefits of uh, dealing with the, with the issue. Uh, as I said earlier, homelessness is not just Victoria's issue. It is a region-wide issue. And, but the mayor of Victoria could actually show leadership and step up to the plate and bring all those regional partners together so that when you go to the province, you have a credible plan, uh, credible ideas, and therefore they would be inclined to help fund and work on a, a, a proper program because they know that they've got buy-in from the entire region. So the mayor of Victoria, I believe, can take the lead. We are the capital city. Dean Horton. I'm actually trying to understand the question, so maybe Right. I see this two ways. One is, is it about provincial level? How do you get the province involved here in the city of Victoria? Or is it about how do you provide leadership as a, as a municipal leader to the province 
to get the province more involved. So how did you interpret that then, Bernard? I would, I would say you can answer both of those. I interpreted it as the province, but go ahead. I mean, we worked hard to get a 10-year plan in homelessness, and what we've got done in the federal government is we said, fund those cities, which is us, Vancouver, Calgary, um, that have that 10-year, and we can bring that money back here from the federal government. From the provincial government, we often will have quarterly meetings with BC Housing, which is part of our coalition in homelessness, to say, how can we get that provincial money here, and we have shown some success. We cannot underestimate um, the ability to just phone up. For example, when we needed to buy the Travelers Inns, we moved forward, showed some risk, showed some leadership, bought the Travelers Inns, but we were also okay. down there meeting with Rich Coleman to make sure the province had our back. And, and fin did. finally, Lisa, 30 seconds. Um, I would do some of the same things that have been said. It is about relationship building. Um, but I, I want to I talk a little bit about the idea of ending homelessness. We've been spending a lot of time, money, money and effort ending homelessness, and that's important, don't get me wrong. But a recent study from the Coalition to End Homelessness showed over a four-year period, 4,300 people used shelters from 2010 to 2014. And of those 4,300 people, 700 were chronically or episodically homeless. 3,600 just needed affordable housing, and we've got to get the province on preventing homelessness with, homelessness with us. Thanks. Bernie, any follow-ups on that? Um, in we're going to actually move to another question um, that does follow up. <laughs> How do you, so all of you have claimed to support housing first, and that's great, that's an evidence-based intervention. However, not all of you support wet housing or the inclusion of um, managed alcohol programs as part of housing first. So how then can you claim to support housing first? I want to point out that I support wet housing, but you, I don't think that was the, uh, the question. Um, I didn't interpret the question as do I support wet housing. I interpreted that question as do I support a managed alcohol program? I believe in wet housing, but I definitely believe that recovery is a primary uh, benefit to the community. So that's what I'm saying. That's not a double answer. That's a, a very clear answer. Wet housing is fine, but I believe in intervention and dealing with recovery. Wet housing and managed alcohol programs are part of housing first. Totally fine. But as I said, I support a recovery model as well. And that's, that's where I'm going. You, you know, we cannot take a one-size-fits-all model, and I think that's one of the issues, Bernie. I know that uh, many within your field and within the, uh, the provincial uh, government take a uh, harm reduction model first. I am saying let's add a recovery model to it. Harm well. reduction includes recovery. Excellent answer. I hope Thank you heard you. that. Harm reduction includes recovery as well. on harm reduction, let's do another question. Do you want to respond to this one, Dean? Well, I just want to say, and perhaps there's a recognition, um, housing first is really hard. We've been there before where the opportunity is, do you add more mats on a church basement, or do you use that money to buy housing like the Traveler's Inn? And it would be nice to say both, but we don't have all the money in the world. And that's why it's hard to be housing first, because it says, we have to make sure we keep people alive. But it's not about making it easier to be homeless. It's about ending homelessness. And it's tough sometimes. You've got to make some hard choices. So I just, it's, it's tough to be put in that role. We recognize it all the time. But I just want to say, it's a hard choice, but I know it's the right choice because it's about ending homelessness. Thank you. Okay, follow-up question on housing first. All of you are very aware that we have a shortage of affordable housing in this city at the low end of market. Housing First requires low affordable housing that's available at the low end of market. So what will you do to increase um, Housing First programs in this city given that challenge? Well, the city has shown leadership on this. And again, it's a question of can you get the senior levels of government funding in. But whether it be, as Stephen mentioned, um, the Greater Victoria Rental Aso uh, Society, all the housing units that we've built along Garge Road, we just passed and moved forward 108 units of below market housing in Vic West. 
and another 65 units that are going to be built across from Save on Foods Arena. It's about working with nonprofits because that takes the profit margin out that actually helps you be able to deliver that affordable housing. Those are the ways that you can deal with it. Then you move forward with housing with supports. So for example, our uh, Streets to Home program. So you use that housing and then those people who need supports to stay in, you provide an opportunity for someone with the skills and the training to provide those supports. Those supports go with the individual. Okay, that's just, extremely I, important. I just wanna make sure everyone has a chance to speak on each of these points before moving on to a, to a new question. Uh, I apologize for being passionate about it. No, that, no, that, that's, that, that's completely okay, Dean. I just wanna, I just wanna make sure that we're, 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 we're ensuring that all the candidates have, to, have a chance to speak to each question before uh, perhaps moving on to another topic. And it's not necessary that everyone has to speak to every topic, uh, um, but uh, Lisa or Ida on that. Well, again, when I say that uh, affordable housing and homelessness is not just Victoria's issue, uh, and to consider that we have to provide all the affordable housing units in Victoria, it's just not realistic. And that's one of the reasons why we do have to talk to other municipal uh, municipalities in this area and say, do you have land? Do you have a partnership that we can work with you on? Are there developers in your area who are willing to help build low-end market housing? So it's not about Victoria always taking on the extra burden because what's going to happen is the taxpayers in Victoria are going to get tired of wanting to be, a, uh, be part of the solution. So let's go regional. Thank you. You know, uh, in that region, one of the things I, I've kind of always thought is why are the other municipalities not at the table on this? And I'm wondering where the creative idea with the city of Victoria actually would be to buy land in other municipalities. <laughs> because there are other municipalities that have lots of land. If we were to do that, and we buy it in the right zones, they would have no choice but to build. <laughs> little, little, uh, yeah. There we go, we're looking for new ideas tonight. Very good one, that's a good one, Stephen. piece of Victoria in Saanich. Sure. Um, so I, I have a, a proposal for a pilot project, and it, it would, at the same, and I agree with the mayor, we need to build new units of housing. We absolutely do. But we also have 11,000 one and two bedroom units in the city of Victoria alone. So I propose a pilot project where we identify 10 building owners who are willing to designate 10% of their units as affordable for a period of 10 years as a pilot project. I'm not saying this is gonna be forever. And in exchange, we give them a property tax exemption to correspond for the lost rent. Try it with 10 buildings. The beauty of this policy is if it works in Victoria, we can ask all of the other uh, municipalities in the region to adopt it as well. So it's experimental, but we need some new creative thinking on this to get those units into play right away. Mary? These are great questions. Um, this one is in reference to the fire at Butte Towers. Um, the question is, since the province allows landlords to throw tenants out for simple reno evictions, thus hiking up the rents, what can you do, this is a question to all the panel, what can you do to influence the province to remove this costly provision? Some thoughts to each of you, and then uh, and and do feel free after each of you have made some initial thoughts to uh, to follow up with your uh, fellow candidates if you need to. So one of the things that the city of Victoria did, and we really faced a lot of these rent evictions earlier, uh, about three four years ago. We actually have a bylaw sitting on the books, and we've taken to a first and second reading. Uh, at any time we had under our emergency powers, we can force somebody for 60 days not to to do to do that eviction. The problem is, is after that 60 days, we can't stop it. So it just sits there, it's an arrow in the quiver that we can just pull the trigger and, and really try and force something to happen. View Towers was a little bit different. They evacuated based on the worry about asbestos and quality like that. It still drives me crazy that there's 100 empty units in View Towers. That would take care of half of our problem with chronic homeless right now today. Um, welcome to a private property system. Um, we need to find some way to get uh, into the units and help those create it. Just it, 
that's just my frustration, don't have the answer of how to make it happen. Yeah. Well, it makes you know, me not have happy. Thank you. You know, Dean, I think one of the things we need to do is show leadership on this. We need to go to the province who creates the landlord tenancy rules. We need to show them the evidence of the issue that's here. It's completely unacceptable what's happening in View Towers and get them to bring in the hammer to deal with this issue. If we were to do that and stand up to these landlords that are behaving this way, that's going to be a far more effective way than just sitting on the sidelines saying there's not much we can do. Uh, let, let's get, let's allow everyone to, to get a word in. Uh, and uh, Dean, it's duly noted that you've got a few thoughts on Stephen's point there. I guess the, the, the problem is that if you don't present uh, it in a way where the province feels that they're actually helping with the, a solution, uh, they're not going to come to the table. So if you're able to show leadership in a way that says, look, at the cost of 100 units being empty and the cost that it's for the city and for the province to deal with people who are on the streets is greater than the cost of allowing those units to be open and perhaps providing a bit of a subsidy or a supplement to allow that to take place, then of course the province isn't going to move on that. So it is about saying, is the cost of saying no higher than the cost of saying yes and get the province to say yes a lot quicker. Thank you, Ada. And Lisa, finally, a, a few thoughts on that before uh, going back to Dean to respond to Stephen. Sure, I think Ida's bang on with that. We've got to show the province how this is a win for them, not just in Victoria, but across the province. This, the current government campaigned on jobs, families, and the economy. The basis of jobs, family, and the economy is housing. And we can remind the government over and over that that's what they're going to do. Jobs, family, and the economy, housing is part of that. Let's have that conversation with the province. It's really important that they understand there's actually a really good economic argument, as Ida says, for housing people in View Towers and elsewhere. And Dean. Well, just a quick question. And although it's frustrating, Stephen, I can no more force you to take someone in your basement than I can force the guy in View Tower to take someone in there. So you have to understand, uh, so Why? it's very simple. But when it comes to leadership, you lead at the provincial level and we worked hard to create a mayor's caucus that can really push back on the province on these issues, whether it's mental health or addictions or housing. We've done that with Mayor Robert, Gregory Robertson, with mayors throughout the province, and we'll continue to do that push because together, the mayors can really have a loud voice against the province. Win -win for but if, if you're fighting provincial legislation and the landlords are trying to use it as a loophole to kick people out of these, these buildings, I'm saying the province is the answer. The province can bring the legislation. We just need to encourage them to do so. I just had a follow-up follow oh. question for Ida Chan because this has come up. but. You're a f former MLA for the area. You're a former member of cabinet. You sat at the table when cabinet decisions were being made. Yeah. You know, what did you do at the table to support homelessness Nothing. and initiatives to end poverty? Yeah. Well, the idea of providing the rent supplements certainly was an initiative that our government at that time supported. And I remember Rich Coleman saying, you know, by providing a rent supplement to allow people to stay in the homes they were in when the rents were going up, when, you know, rather than having them move to a neighborhood where their children would have to be uprooted and not go to the same school, the amount of po providing that sum every month that nobody needs to know about, but allows that family to have the dignity of staying in the neighborhood was really important. We could not have built enough units to m put people in if they were uprooted from that area. So the rent supplements, which I believe everyone on this stage would agree, has been very helpful and has provided an opportunity for people to stay in their homes rather than having to move to another part of town and have their whole family disrupted. Temporary. Rent supplements are permanent. No, they're not. They are for the people who are receiving them no, and it not. is based on income. They're not permanent. Any thoughts from other uh, candidates on the point of rent supplements or the role of the province in uh, uh, in solving some of these points, some of these issues. Back to the panel. I have four questions um, from people um, all in the same basic, basic vein. 
Um, in a nutshell, the main cause of homelessness is not mental health or addictions, it's poverty. Um, there's a stigma, there's a discrimination connected with, with poverty. And in some of the, uh, the uh, campaigns have talked about panhandling, aggressive panhandling, getting rid of it, eradicating it, eliminating it, and so on. As mayor, how would you eliminate poverty? Is criminalization of panhandling and poverty the right approach? Who'd like to start? Lisa? Sure, I'll start on this one. Um, uh, so criminalizing uh, panhandling is not the way to solve poverty. Uh, we need to make sure that people have access to adequate income. How do we do that? We need to go back to the province for one moment and then we can also look at ourselves. So <laughs> 610 a month, who could live on that? How many people, don't answer this, a lot of people in this room are living on 610 a month with 375 shelter allowance. $900 for disability, that's good, not good enough. Those rates, it is a shame, Kim, those rates have not gone up in a long time. Again, we've got a really strong role to play in advocating uh, for that. My time's up, so hopefully I'll get to speak because I've got another idea too. It's not all about the province, we've got our own responsibilities too, but we've got to go to the province. Some initial thoughts on that point from other candidates and then, uh, um, and then we'll open it up a bit. Well, I mean, I'm totally against what's been proposed by some people to have a red zone bylaw that anybody who panhandles, you can run them out of town or you're not allowed to sit on the streets. Like, this is a progressive town. We believe in the Charter of Rights and Freedom. You just don't get to say, we don't like the way you look, you have to leave, but we're going to keep the guys that look like us. I mean, this is not what we do. The answer is, as Lisa said, it's housing, it's access to food, it's access to services, it's access to mental health facilities, and it's access to job training. Now, we have to make sure we're supporting our, our, our single parent families and children, because that's where the next generations are coming. Poverty is a very complex issue, but we shouldn't be afraid to take it on. Tent City. I know. Thanks very much. And I think this perhaps was pointed at me because today I did talk about a new policy dealing with aggressive panhandling. And I want to be clear, it is not the activity, it is about the behavior. And for those who are aggressive, and there aren't as many as you may think, but there are some who are aggressive, which actually are making it unsafe for our seniors and our young mothers with their children to come downtown and feel comfortable. It is making it hard for our shop owners to be in business, and that's why we're having a lot of our merchants close up. So for those people who have bad behavior, bad behavior that intimidates, I do believe that we have to ask them to move. But for those who are not creating a nuisance, everyone has a right to the streets, but those who have bad behavior, bad behavior do not have more rights than those that have good behavior. Politicians. Stephen. So, um, I hope this is not handed to me as well, because I mean, if you read the first line of my panhandling uh, uh, policy there, I'm saying that the first thing we need to do is to work with council and service providers to eliminate the need of panhandling. That's the first thing. But I have to say, and I know many people downtown have been in the situation or have been the subject of aggressive panhandling. I think what we need to find is ways to reduce that. That's the first thing. But again, ex aggressive behavior downtown, we cannot have it. I don't care whether it's a panhandler or whether it's somebody catcalling women downtown, it has to stop. Can I, can I put this, that back to Lisa and, and Dean? Because clearly there, there are, uh, so there's sort of a split between the four of you on that point. Uh, and if Elisa and Dean could perhaps address that point of aggressive behavior. Sure, well somebody from the audience already answered the question. Oftentimes when we see aggressive behavior, it's a mental health issue. That person needs help. That person needs help first. And that's our role as a compassionate, caring city, is to put all of the supports in place so that person doesn't have to have that. You know, ask the people I live with. Sometimes I can get aggressive, sometimes I can get excited, but I have the privacy of my home to do that in. Right on. Yeah. So that's all I have to say on that. Follow up to Stephen briefly here. 
Uh, sorry, Dean, uh, I, I just saw his finger go up for, yeah. for a second. I, I just want to say that I, I agree with what Lisa said, that we need to do it. That's not what we're talking about here. So anybody that tries to interpret that what I am proposing is any way as to what Dean has suggested, that we don't like those individuals, the look of those individuals in the city, completely wrong. I'm saying it's aggressive behavior. And as you can see, if I, I am a big advocate for dealing with mental health issues, and I believe in that, and that's how we deal with it. That's, those are not the people we're talking about here. And please jump in, you know, don't look at me necessarily, your mic's wrong. <laughs> All I'm gonna say is, I mean, this was MLA, uh, liberal MLA, Lauren Maincutt's first shoe, is what he did in Kelowna, the whole safe street things are about running the people off that, that didn't work. Fundamentally came to this, if it's a criminal code offense where you are threatening somebody, then the police will be involved, but then the courts get to be involved, so you're not unjustly accused, and you have all the protection of the law. Um, if you're just saying, we don't allow this behavior because we don't like it in the downtown, and that's what I'm hearing, that it's not a criminal offense, they get to be the own judge, then I have a difficulty, because everyone has the right to be safe under the law. Amen. People who are coming downtown aren't given that opportunity to feel safe. Some people actually avoid downtown, seniors, mothers with children. I've heard it on the doorstep. And that is what the issue is here. So aggressive behavior, as Stephen has indicated as well, and I'm saying aggressive behavior is what should not be tolerated. For those who have mental illnesses uh, and addictions, absolutely we need to find the proper place for them to get the support services where they can be helped get a warm meal, better clothing, uh, a roof over the head and get them support services they need. But for those who believe that they can aggressively intimidate our seniors on our streets, that's, that's, not, that's not right. Back to the panel. Some clear statements there, which is, which is nice to hear. Okay, this question um, just came from the audience, and I personally immediately um, put it to the top. I think it's, it's a super important question. How do the candidates, how do each of you as candidates, intend to communicate more effectively with the homeless community in order to address their needs? Well, one thing that I have been doing actually for the past four weeks is going to the Saturday morning breakfast and having a chat with the people that uh, are living on the street, and I have uh, over my career been dealing uh, with, with these stories. I think there needs to be more communication. I think that uh, politicians of all stripes should actually be walking the talk and getting in there and finding out what's going on. One of the things I'd like to do is set up a, a, a community council that involves all of the uh, service providers or represents from the service providers in the neighborhoods and include uh, the people that are involved in this discussion that we're talking about and have, have, have a, a round table discussion. We used to do that on a frequent basis. I've been in and moderated and participated in them. I don't think we're doing it enough. Dean? One of the things we did uh, was really important for us at the Coalition End Homelessness is we created a social inclusion advisory committee, and I think actually the uh, coordinator is here and does an amazing okay. job to make sure that those experiencing homelessness have a voice there to influence the funders, the city, and others. That's one way to make sure that voice is there. The second way is when we get out and we do uh, programs. We, I mean, we all come here individually, and, and, and Ida and myself and Lisa have all been here serving. Um, through a variety of occasions, and that's an opportunity for us on one-on-one, -on -one. and we challenge all the mayors and councillors throughout the region to come down here and do it. So whether it's serving, or I think we even do a car wash through a frontier, we, uh, that's the informal way that we can make sure that that message goes out. So strategically and informally, both ways are successful to spread the message. I know then, Lisa. Yeah. So in my life, in public life, I have always found the best way to communicate actually is to engage with the community and be involved in their events. I've always said that for people who came into my office and sat down and talked to me, I didn't understand they were just giving me a piece of paper, which is why I have always volunteered with a number of organizations and gone out to their events and their fundraising efforts and there's to find out the people they were supporting and the people who needed the support. So uh, my, for those who know me will know that I very much engage with the community, participate in what they're involved in. And that's what I would continue to do. I don't want to hear it from your organization. I would rather hear it from you. 
Elisa. I'd start with a lot of cups of coffee on a regular basis, and that's what I've that's what I've done as a counselor. There are many people in this room who I've sat down and had coffee with and listened to their stories and listened to their needs. Cups of coffee are a good start. Councillor Marianne Alto and I, along with the Vancouver Island Public Interest Research Group, the Youth Council, and many others, and with the support of this council, have created a group called the Community Action Plan on Discrimination. And that group meets the fourth Friday of every month at City Hall. We wanted to make City Hall the place that people who are experiencing discrimination, whether racial discrimination, discrimination because they're poor, that there is a place at our City Hall for that conversation to happen. And it's not just about sitting around and talking, it's the community action plan on discrimination, and I look forward to continuing to work on that as your mayor. Any, any follow-ups just briefly here? I, I see some people looking in my direction, but before the panel gets back to it. Yeah, we're good. Panel, okay. Would, here's a follow-up to that question. Would any of the candidates be willing to live on the street for 30 days on 235 per month allowance? Okay, well, as I've said, I, I've, I've lived on the street with less than that. Uh, when I was in uh, 22, actually, I lived on the streets in Toronto, and it was, uh, you know, I can remember those days. They, they are not the best days of my life. I have to tell you that it was extremely difficult. So I do know the struggle that people go through. And um, it's, it's why this subject is passionate to me. So I've done it. I've lived on the street with far less than that. What year was that a yes or no? When I was, so I'm 56 <laughs> now. And so would you be willing to do it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. I had to no, it was in my life. Would you, like the question I, I do it. I, yeah, I do it again. Yeah. So, I don't, a lot of people don't know about my background, but I grew up in a very uh, low income and modest income family to the extent where um, our house was expropriated from government when I was 10 years old. And the thought of being homeless was very real to me at that time. So, we did struggle, our family, and lived on a very small amounts of money. My parents were both working class family, uh, our uh, parents. So I don't believe that living on the streets would necessarily make me understand more than what you are expecting me to, uh, as, a, as your mayor, uh, develop for you in terms of a program. Is that a yes no. And that's no. why, no, I would not then. Because I don't believe it's going to accomplish what you want to be accomplished. Do you know what you want? Homes. Lisa, then Dean. Um, sure, I would live on the streets for one month for $235 a month. But you know what? Then I wouldn't be able to do a good job as your mayor. And you know what? No one living on the streets at $235 a month can do a good job at whatever they're trying to do with their lives. And that, so I'm, I'm willing to go out and, you know, spend two week, two days, three, so, some time to understand firsthand what you're experiencing, but I know it sucks. I know it's a problem. No, I, think, I mean, I, so if I did that, I wouldn't be a good mayor, just like those of you who are living on the street in those conditions can't live your lives to the fullest because of those conditions. So invite me to come out for a couple of nights so I can get that hands-on, but a month, no one should be living there, and that's what I'm going to be focusing my efforts on. Woo! And I do expect an invite. I mean, I, I, I appreciate very much what everybody here has said. Uh, directly to the question, uh, no, um, I have uh, obligations to my family and my children, and so to take a month out of that, that's important, and they have that. But let me say this, I mean, I spent seven years working with street kids, being a night outreach worker, spending time every night talking, remember the old day and night cafe on Yates Street? Yeah. You know, yeah. buying a burger, as Lisa said, having a cup of coffee, connecting with those kids, making sure that you're, and it sucks sometimes, when they, you knew that they were walking around all night because they were too scared to sit down and sleep. So no. And we would open the community youth center and they would come in and sleep on the couches and people say, what are you doing? Well, because you knew what they're going through and you knew that you were fortunate to be able to go home because you had a bed that night. And it sucks. Lisa's right, it's not right, and it's really hard, and that's why we know that Housing First is the first approach. Get settled, get them housing, and then we can start to change lives. You Those know, you can say it sucks, and I have to say this. Uh, I totally sympathize with what Dean has just said. It is, it's an awful situation. I remember days just walking the streets, 
and at nighttime you couldn't go to sleep. So what you would do, and I think many people know this, is you'd go to the bus uh, shelter, you'd sit there and you'd fall asleep until you hoped that the uh, security guard wouldn't throw you out of the train station at Union. That's how you survive. And you just pray that you'd be able to get a couple of bucks just to, uh, to, to get some food. And we have and, and you were frightened of we going to you were frightened of going to shelters, and uh, because they, they were very very scary. I had a 22 year old, it petrified me to no end. So I totally understand what uh, people are going through, and if you feel that it's changed and that I need to experience that because that's something that uh, you feel would it allow me to uh, further the cause of homelessness, I'm all for it. That was a good pointed question. Back to the panel. Um, uh, Dean Fortney addressed this a little bit in the rapid fire questions, but this is to all the candidates. Please address succinctly your plan for a safe injection site. Who'd like to start on this one? Dean? When they closed Cormorant Street, which was the, the needle exchange, uh, it, it got to a point where we know that we need to have those harm reduction services, but we knew that we had to do it right, because if it failed again, we would never get that service in this town. So we worked really hard, and over the last four years, we have established fixed needle exchanges with medical services on Johnson Street and just over on Cook Street. Both of those facilities, with those medical services and with the harm reduction services coming down, can be transitioned into what's known as supervised consumption sites. It's about saying, and when is the community ready? In my opinion, and it's funny because I've been door knocking in that area, as a lot of people say, you know, this should just be a safe consumption site because, you know, it's the outside, it's the outside drug use that causes a lot of concern, and that's where the overdoses happen. So bring it in, have access to those services that can help affect change. Those are the two sites we have. Those are the two we're ready to move forward. It's about just moving the Dr. Peters forward, model forward. We can do that. Lisa? Uh, yeah, it sounds like we're well on our way to doing it. I'd like to see the action continue. Um, I think that uh, Marianne Alto has been a real leader on this, and she's been working directly with the Yes to STS, SCS, there I got the acronym right, working really hard with that group. And what's important to me about her approach and the approach that I support is that the people who are using and needing the services have a voice in making sure they're set up right, and from a governance perspective, have an ongoing say in how those services are delivered. So I hope to see Marianne re-elected, and I will uh, support the work that she and the rest of the city are doing on this. I, I think the answer has already been given because, uh, uh, as Dean has said, where there was a site that it was in an area that no one supported, it just created problems. And so you don't want to put it in an area that it just creates more confrontation what you do need to find is uh, where there are health uh, units in, in certain neighborhoods that can accommodate uh, fixed needle exchange uh, safe injection sites, those kinds of things, and then make it work within those areas, and then also have the support services that are needed, the medical services that actually are needed to help people who are then able to go to those places. All I would ask is that um, as, as we move forward, as I've said, that I would hope that uh, we would have intervention and, and recovery and treatment. And uh, the only other thing I would say is that uh, I think what we need to do is educate the community around these facilities and make sure that they are fully aware of what they are and the benefits. So that's the only thing I would want to add. <coughs> what, a follow up to Lisa there? Well, I just want to say that it's amazing that all four of us sitting up here are supportive of safe consumption sites and are willing to take action. And I think that that has a large uh, piece goes to many of the people in this room who've been pushing us for a long time. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be sitting here on the stage with all of us saying, yeah, let's do it. That's, that's, that's a milestone. And I think the real turning point that happened for this city is when we took three or four of our inspectors and deputy chiefs from the city of Victoria we took them over to see the Dr. Peters Center. And it's in St. Paul's, and it's across the road from a school. It's across the road from a community center. And all the people live there. And it integrates fine, and no one knows it exists. So we know we can do it well within communities and with communities. Um, so yeah, let's do it. Any, any uh, I just want to jump in on, on one quick point here, if I could. Any, any thoughts on, uh, on the fact that, yes, there's unanimous support here, it seems, in, in various forms. 
but there's very little support or no support, and, and in fact a lot of antagonism from the federal government on these issues, especially a safe injection site. Any thoughts on, on dealing with well, that? Well, I think that's their problem. They'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I'll just say, the interesting thing about the Dr. Peters model is because it's based on a medical model and under the nurse's ethics that they don't need federal approval yeah. to do it. Yeah. And they don't have federal approval, right. they just do it. Bernie knows all the details. I just, I, have, I just had a follow up question. Yeah. Um, is that you're in lockstep, which is great on that issue, but you're not all, which is, you know, on safe injection sites, you seem to be in agreement. But on a legal drug, alcohol, you're not supportive. You're not all supportive of wet housing. There seems to be a... Ida, you said yeah. you're not inclined to support wet housing, be but you're okay yeah. with safe injection Well, site. because I said I wasn't, I haven't been given enough, I guess, information and haven't spoken to enough people who can let me know whether what are the outcomes of that. With safe injection sites, I have seen where, in fact, they do save lives. I've seen the, the evidence, and I've talked to people about that, and what I'm saying is I haven't had that benefit of that um, with the, the Maddish alcohol program that you were stating. So that's one of the reasons why I said that. So what, what, what are you going to do for, to bring yourself up to speed and be informed? Well, obviously, uh, you know, if that is going to be a component of the housing first, or is a component of the housing first, um, I would make sure that I speak to those who are experts at it and get all the uh, opinions that are there. And I just want to clarify with you because initially you said you said you were you said no to wet housing, but you. I'm no, just I, to I'm that. for wet housing, but I want I believe that a recovery model is something that's very important. You can't be for recovery. This is what I've learned, and then say uh, we are going to continue to feed, um, uh, provide alcohol to those that, that need alcohol. So what I'm saying is, absolutely. I mean, I already talked about the continuum that I would like to see. Uh, the model uh, Im imported from Portland, where we go into wet housing and then we transition through to um, detox, through uh, transitional housing and then support. That's the model I would like to see. But to now, be clear, e either, either I'm not making myself clear or uh, I don't fully understand the well, question. Well, I, th right? I, think, I think there just might be some confusion because I don't think anyone in this room is against recovery. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm for it. <laughs> I'm for recovery. Uh, for people who don't know, I'm also a trained addiction counselor, what I did. And, and part of understanding is, yes, Stephen says, yes, you have to have those services there when people are ready. There are times when people are never ready. But that's okay, and we need to accept that. I want to be there for when people are ready, that we move forward with recovery, we move forward with abstinence, but that's one model. And we also have to make sure that we're, we're taking a humane approach to how we deal with people, the individuals. I think Stephen's plan that he announced earlier for asking people in recovery what they needed when, before they were in recovery, I think that's a really good idea. So that's, I think Stephen hasn't said that yet tonight, but that's something that I think is, is an important part of, of what he's bringing to the table. I'd like to bring it back to poverty again. I've got a great question here on the working homeless. The people who are working two jobs and couch surfing are living out of their cars. How will you address the working homeless? Without, oh. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it is, I mean, the mayor says it's housing, it's absolutely housing. But without, without um, you know, beating a, a drum too hard, to build new units of housing takes a long time. It takes a long time and a lot of money, and it's really important that we keep doing that. It's very important. But I, again, I would like to try this proposal where we, and it already happens a little bit with Pacifica. They identify private sector landlords and they say, hey, would you mind dropping your rent from 750 to 550 so that we can rent it to one of our clients? And you know what? There are people, there are landlords in this town that say, yeah, I'll do that. So what if we had a small incentive to get more of those units into play. So the guy who's working, living, sorry, in Cridge Park and working at Save On Foods grocery store has a place where he can go and sleep. Stephen, Ida, or? 
You know, uh, one of the issues that I have, I mean, I don't, I believe, and I think the people at Kool-Aid as well, when I've been speaking to Don McC uh, McTavish, have said that emergency shelters are not a solution to homelessness. It's a temporary band-aid sort of situation. Oh, we know but I, I think what we need to do, though, is for the working poor, when they're in those situations, if they have connection with the shelters, we need to make sure that they have a stable environment. So right now, I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there's limits on the length of time someone can stay. In a, in a shelter. I think yeah. we need to reevaluate that to ensure that we provide some stability for the working poor. Dina Ryder. Well, I think, you know, it's already been said that, you know, to get people stabilized, they need housing, but we cannot build housing fast enough for the demands that are there. So we do have to take uh, a look at what uh, housing options are there. We take, we can talk to to uh, landlords, uh, as Lisa has suggested, but even then, if people aren't willing to come to the table, we're not going to get to that solution fast enough. Uh, you know, the idea of allowing people to, you know, look at their own places and open up their, their uh, I guess, rooms and suites that are available. Uh, secondary suites can be can be uh, utilized to help people who are at least wanting more than a 30-day stay, but perhaps a six month before the uh, housing development comes available for them to move into. So it, it does mean a mixture uh, in communities, but I would like to see them in proper neighborhoods so that people can integrate well and also establish some roots. Proper neighborhoods? Proper, that's what I thought. In proper neighborhoods, proper. on properties, neighborhoods. Can I tell a brief story from the 1950s? No? Okay. Were you around in the 50s? Well, it's just, just briefly, it's just to illustrate a point. It's just to, it, no, it's just to illustrate a point. So this comes from my PhD research. Dur oh, actually, it was during the 40s. During the Second World War, there were ads in the Times colonists. Could you please, fellow citizen, house a homeless war worker? And that was, I was searching for homeless, right? That was what my topic, can you house a homeless war worker? And you know what? Across the city, people stepped up to house people who were homeless, but were here to work for the war. So I'm not saying that we open up our houses necessarily, but I'm just saying that in the past, there were people in the city who are willing to house homeless war workers. What about housing poor workers? Just, you know, that's way outside the box. But uh, I thought I'd share some inspiration from our city in the past. Stephen. You know, as we've been going through these uh, mayoral debates, it's been very interesting. We've gone into the neighborhood associations. And the neighborhood associations, this question has come up again and again and again. And what I think we, one of the issues we'd like to do is maybe actually establish housing projects, housing initiatives and have them come from the neighborhood associations. If the neighborhood associations are so concerned about this issue, let's bring them to the table and ha have them find solutions within their community uh, all around the city. And I think that would make a, a significant change. Dean, we haven't heard from you on this. Well, I did say housing, and I want to throw it out. It, it's difficult, because we tried to put some supportive housing into Rockland. And my goodness, did we get beat up. Um, but you know, we stood there in the church in front of 50 people and advocated. It wasn't one that we were willing to back down on. Now, unfortunately, the funding fell through. We couldn't move that forward. But we also stood there at city council when a, a, an organization came forward and said, we want to put in a recovery home just in Lee Avenue over by Oak Bay. And again, we had 12 to 14 people come out and say, this will be terrible. There'll be alcoholics all over the place. Our neighborhood will fall. And council showed the courage to say, no, we believe this is important, and we were able to move it forward. So those are the small local areas we can do it, but we've also done it in a big way. I remember people saying, don't go out and talk about legalizing secondary suites, you'll get unelected. You know what? We legalized secondary suites. And over the last six years, there's been more than 300 new secondary suites created. We even did an incentive program, which I want to redo, where we give $5,000 incentive for someone to create a secondary suite. Because you know why? Because families are starting to hope uh, to buy a home can have that as a mortgage helper. Seniors can stay in the home longer. And single parents with kids have a backyard to play in. Okay. And it's just redensifying neighborhoods. It's very been successful. There's many ways we can do it. And we just need to show courage, which we have, and we will continue to fight for what's right. It's half past eight right now. We've got another half hour, and we, uh, I would like to squeeze in as many more as possible. I see they're still coming in, and, and your table is covered with them. <laughs> I just want to say, I just want to acknowledge um, the audience for their questions, because um, this is we've been trying to kind of summarize them and pot compile them together, and although we won't get to ask it, all of them, we're going to ask as many as we can. So here's, here's one that's back to bylaws. 
And this has to do with the fact that park campers are fined repeatedly for not cleaning up and not uh, by 7 a.m. in the morning. And um, the information that's written here says it's up to $150 per offense. Now, that's the city who also has a strategy and a goal of ending homelessness. So as the mayor, will you continue to support this bylaw or what will you do to ensure um, that people are not fined because that acts as a barrier to housing? Well, I definitely think the one thing that we need to do right now, the way early morning wake up call is done by the Victoria Police Department. I think that's a pretty uh, expensive and I think overkill to the issue. What I would like to see is that we start to integrate social service teams to go into the parks, start working with the people that uh, have it necessary to, to be there so we can find solutions. I also think that we should start, I mean, finding somebody who has no money is the most ridiculous thing in the world. So I think that should just come off the table. But, ladies and gentlemen, I think we do need to realize that as an entire community, we have a responsibility to show respect for everybody. And that, I think, is a way that we need to kind of move to encourage those, those that are using the parks to be responsible and realize that the parks are for everybody. They're not just for a specific group of people. Lisa. Uh, I'm going to keep it short because I want to hear the rest of the questions. I agree with Stephen. It makes no sense to find people who don't have money to pay the fines. So that seems like we've got a lot of bylaw tidying to do after the next election. Uh, and so I would support removing fines for people who aren't going to be able to pay them anyways. Ida or Dean on the issue of parks and camping. Makes sense. Uh, some quick ones. Uh, I'm surprised to even hear the writing. I mean, no one expects them to be paid. Uh, I'm assuming that the only reason they do that is to show some sort of uh, no one's paying the rules and, and you can do move it forward. Ultimately, ultimately, there's a recognition that you have to, have to provide balance within the parks. What we've said is there's no camping within children's areas, no camping in sensitive ecosystems, and no camping on fixed fields. Um, other than that, this, we're, we're, we, are, uh, we allow camping in parks um, between, from dusk till dawn, uh, and the goal is to make sure that there is first emergency shelters, but more importantly, housing for people. Just very quickly to clarify, Ida, you support the current bylaw as it stands? No, I said it makes sense to not be fining if we're not ever going to collect, but that's where the cost sure. of saying no far outweighs the cost of saying yes, which means to, you know, deal with yeah. that more practically. Thank you. And I, I actually think that the mayor should go back to his office today and inform the chief bylaw officer to stop handing out these tickets. Back to the panel. Last week there was a report released um, that stated Victoria is the highest per capita deaths of homeless people in BC. Yes. And this is to yes. the panel, why do you think that is? Um, probably like many of you, when I saw that report come out from Megaphone and when I saw the Czech News story, I felt really, really sad for our city. Ida reminds us of this a lot. We're the capital city of this province, and we have the highest number of homeless deaths. Yes, we do. Because we don't have enough housing. And to go back to my earlier point, we don't have enough work at the prevention level to prevent people from ending up on the streets in the first place. The coalition's report that was released also showed us that 2010, to 2014 was the period of the study. We have done a lot, as the mayor says, but not nearly enough because in 2014, more people were using shelters than they were in 2010. So we've got to tackle this in a comprehensive, non-ideological, open-minded, creative way so that next time Megaphone does its report, we are not at the bottom. Have enough Not enough. Empty buildings, though. We have a lot of empty buildings. Yeah, we do. The letter carrier and the carpenter. I know we've got a lot of empty buildings. We're going to give uh, the other three candidates a chance to speak to that point of homeless deaths and the report that was out. Victoria, much like Vancouver, how can I put it? The face of homelessness is in the city of Victoria. Throughout the region, people come in. And I've often said that, that we're the ones that, that people come here. Uh, whether it be from Souk, whether it be from Colwood, whether it be from Oak Bay, this is where the face of homeless is. For us in Vancouver, that's why the numbers are higher. 
but I'm not trying to explain this away. It's unacceptable because this is a British Columbia issue. It is a Canada issue. These are Canadian citizens, these are British Columbians, and these are our regional residents who are dying. And fundamentally, what is it? It's housing. It's access to medical services. These are important things. They die from suicide. They die from illness. They die from overdose or from, from, from alcoholism. That, that's the, what they sign on the form. But we know fundamentally that if we can get people into houses, that can change. If I have an extra minute, maybe I'll use it for my wrap-up because it's a really important story. Right Thank you. Yeah. Yes, when I uh, saw that report, and I was shocked as well because I would not have expected that to be the case. So it's a wake-up call. And the wake-up call is that we do have to do better. And maybe it, the reason why, again, is because we haven't been working across the region well enough with our other municipal partners, which is what we need to start doing better and giving everyone an opportunity to help solve this problem. The Victoria population of 83,000 people cannot do it on their own. And we need to stand tall with each other and say, this isn't good enough, it's not acceptable, and we m must get to a, you know, get to that, get that number reversed, get that trend reversed, no matter how that is going to happen, but work with our, our regional partners to do that. You know, if this was a disease, and we saw an, ex an unacceptable amount of people dying from disease. It would be called a health crisis and the government would step immediately and deal with it. I think we need to pressure them to realize that this is a crisis and we need support immediately. And as a city of Victoria, I think we should be making a crisis situation. I mean, basically, this it's emergency management of, of the street and I think we need to take more action and make sure that we get at least more emergency shelter beds open immediately, and then we can go from there. But I mean, this, is, it's a blight on our city and it's a blight on the province. Back to the panel. Got a question here that's quite relevant given the, uh, the forecast for the next couple of days. How can the extreme weather protocol tell at 11 a.m. what the weather is going to be like at 3 a.m. in the morning? Pretty pragmatic question. Well, I mean, the issue really shouldn't be whether uh, it's a weather-related situation. It should be whether we have beds available for the people that don't have homes to sleep in. Why, you know, it's windy one day, therefore we'll let them sleep inside. It's raining one day and we'll let them sleep inside. That's ridiculous. But the bed should just be available, period. Well, anyone else on that point? Well, the, I mean, the multi-million dollar question is how? How do we get those beds available? And I think what is needed is more of what's happening. And also, again, I'm going to reiterate this over and over again, because I think that our approach needs to be broadened. And no one's mentioned the federal government yet, or not too much. And again, the report that was provided to us and a talk that was given by a prof uh, professor from York University a couple weeks ago called The Economics of Homelessness showed that if we just go back to the federal government and ask them to spend the same amount that they did in 1989, in 1989 on affordable housing, that we'd be a long way to solving the problem. And let's not forget, next year is a federal election, and if I am elected mayor, I've already decided that I'm gonna be a dog with a bone about ho housing, that is going to be the issue that I make for the election. So we, we can't do it alone. Dean or Ida, on that point of emergency shelter beds, when they're available and when they're not? Well, one of the things that are interesting is was highlighted by Megaphone's report that they, they really wanted to see more cold and wet weather emergency shelter beds available. Um, part of where they got that from is from the City of Victoria. It was Councillor Charlene thornton Joe working with Mary Ellen Lowe at the time in January of 2004, then that first cold snap that went in and opened up the old Silver Threads building to start what's known as now as the cold and wet weather shelter protocol. Now, this, the dynamics of it is, Jen Book makes the call. She's the coordinator, she makes the call, she manages the money, she is coordinated with those, uh, ha has a, a steering committee that works with her and makes it happen. For those that don't know, um, I will quickly say, um, ultimately there's 85, so the seasonal emergency shelter programs is adds 85 sleeping mats to the 175 existing emergency shelter mats. During the protocol, another 105 additional mats are, are come online when their weather presents a threat to human health and well-being. 
Again, you can spend a lot of money putting more and more mats on, and during that cold and wet weather protocol, you need to make sure people come inside, but then fundamentally you have to do the work to get them housing, to get them into housing, because, oh, red light's up, I'll come because Any thoughts before we move on to another question? Could, can we kind of talk about yeah. this amongst ourselves? Because I, I think that really everyone's kind of in the same issue. So I guess the question I want to ask uh, the other members of the panel, why are the other municipalities and uh, regional government not coming to the table as effectively as they could? Because we say this is a regional issue. So what's blocking them? I mean, Dean, you've had the experience for six years. What's stopping them from coming to the table? A journalist coming through and Stephen. Well, I mean, I just want to know what's going on because, yeah, I mean, fair, surely fair we, enough, we talk I, I about think this. That's a, 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 it's a reasonable point. What's doing? It has been, I, mean, I will say in the past, I've heard other mayors say, homeless is not my issue. My, my, my citizens don't come and talk to me about homelessness. Over the last five years, the coalition has worked hard to make it a regional issue. And so you see today that, um, you know, uh, Hope Center in Souk is now open, which is, an, is a homeless youth program going on. We have four projects in Saanich that will soon be built or soon opening in the next little bit. People throughout the region are seeing it as the issue. They're starting to step up. And we deliberately went after councillors and mayors from around the region to sit on the coalition to end homelessness. So we could have exactly that conversation. What are you going to do? to make this happen. And so there has been movement. I wish there be more because with their voices we can get more funding from the provincial government. Um, but we are actually seeing units built throughout the region. So much more to do. There's so much more to do. You know, but the I, have, I have, have to say, w this um, debate that we're having here is terrific and I think we need to be talking about it. But I would really encourage the coalition and I would encourage our place to start getting the other mayors here and, and grilling them yes. as aggressively as you are grilling the candidates <laughs> uh, in Victoria. I do want, uh, do want to get a, another question or two in here, but, but